Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. Joining me way over there... Back where he started from, his name is Dan Rubenstein out there in beautiful Southern California. Dan, how are you? You know, Ty, life is good out west. I'll I'll say it again. I've said it before. It's about 60 degrees. Had a great Italian meal last night. Been weirdly staying on East Coast time. Okay, okay. So now hold on. Pause. Yeah. How? How do you do that? Uh, Been going to sleep around 9 p.m. Been waking up about 6 a.m. But you go to sleep at 9 p.m. normally. Right. So basically, I'm just sleeping a little bit more than okay. usual. Right. Uh, no complaints. Yeah. Saying I'm right now in my childhood bedroom at my folks' place out in uh, in the valley in L.A. What is what is the weather situation in Southern California right now? Not bad, Ty. It's not like tropical, but I was out in Palm Springs for camera guy Dave's wedding, and that was that was very nice. I was about 75 degrees. It's about 60 degrees, Ty. No rain. Going Ooh. up to San Francisco for a couple days. Just going on a tour. That's toasty, baby. It is. And I'm going to Chicago next week, so it's about to take a turn. About to, to about take 17 a 17 degrees. Turn for the worse. Welcome back in with Dan and I. We run a little podcast you might have heard of. We talk college football. It is the solid Verbal, our schedule from this point forward, at a minimum, we've got a show next Wednesday where we'll talk about our final wave of bowl games, including the playoffs, the big playoffs. And at a minimum, we'll be doing at least the Friday before the national championship, a preview show. We'll talk about all sorts of recaps and whatnot. So your best bet to figure out when we're going to be dropping shows is to stay tuned to our Twitter feed, our Facebook page, our Instagram account, our website, solidverbal.com. We do have a bit of a modified schedule here over the holidays, but at a minimum, Daniel, we promise to deliver content to people who might be on the road for Christmas, who might be on the road for New Year's. Perhaps you're on the road to a New Year's Day bowl game or a playoff game. The Verbal will be with you live in living color. Yeah, I think we're going to try to do the same thing we did last year as for like attacking the national championship game. Whichever two teams are in it from a few different angles with a few different people, we'll record some of it before we actually get out to Atlanta and a couple more when we get out to Atlanta. So hopefully we can have that show up later on in the day Friday so you can listen to it all weekend before the game really get it up uh, a good window before a good window before we will have more details forthcoming on the live show the additional lot of tickets for january 6th we're also working on something a little special in the lab that we can't reveal quite yet Ooh, that would be for probably earlier on in the weekend ish that would be correct yeah got something cool not ready to unleash the beast yet but that is as we say in the industry a tease daniel I cannot wait for you to unleash your beast, Ty. I cannot. Nor nor can I. Dan, <laughs> let's get right into it. We have breaking news. Boop, 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 boop. Daniel, just because yeah. you went out to the West Coast does not mean you can escape the hotbed of news that we have brewing here in the college football world. Now, as some of you might have noticed from... Reading the interwebs, college football has a new early signing period. It sort of changes the schedule as we know it, at least on the recruiting side of things. That new early signing period is between today, which is December 20th when we're recording, and on Friday, December 22nd. Between now and then, guys are going to be signing all over the place. If you want more details on the the where's and the why's and the how's of the new schedule, I would advise, it was very instructive for me, to read Bud Elliott's piece out on SB Nation. He's been writing about it. He's been guessing about how things might change from this point forward, given some of the formatting adjustments that they've made in college football. But if you really want to deep dive and get more info on the new signing period, Dan, Bud Elliott's a good resource for you. My main takeaway Mm -hmm. is that the new signing period is basically the new signing day, right? 
Yeah, 19 of the top 25, at least for the blue chip guys right now, 19 of the top 25 on 24-7's composite rankings have signed or I think are expected to sign maybe 19, 20, 21. We're recording this uh, evening time, East Coast time on Wednesday. So who knows what will happen in the next you know few hours today in the next couple days. We apologize. This show, once again, is not live. So there, it, it seems like an overwhelming majority, at least of the top kids, will sign though there's i think a good chunk of them that will wait until february to take more visits which certainly is an an advantage for for kids that are deciding between a number of schools have a lot of options and honestly a lot of these guys are just finishing up their high school playoff time and haven't had time these past few weeks as it's uh, the clock has sort of ticked down to this early national signing day to take you know their last visit or two so i think there there are some guys that are waiting to do that there's some you know people be it for stanford or notre dame or ucla or duke or northwestern that have to wait on some academics that uh, have not fully come in the the final or i guess the second to last uh, semester in high school and it affects, you know, a number of kids. There's coaching changes that are happening. So you have coaches scrambling a lot quicker than they used to before an early February signing day. You have teams in early bowl games. I know just from somebody that is, you know, as I am following Oregon, this was where this past weekend was supposed to be a huge recruiting weekend and could not be so anymore because of the Las Vegas bowl. The bowl so yeah. there's a, a number of pieces that are being shuffled across the deck because of this early signing period. And I also get Ty why, you know, some people prefer this. I don't, I don't think coaches fully prefer it, but maybe kids who have been committed for a long time that just want to get the process over, move on with either the rest of their high school career as a, as a student, just as a kid for the last few months or getting ready to enroll as an early enrollee in uh in their college of choice. So it definitely is a different dynamic. What What's interesting to me is now we've got this new early signing period. I think they're going to try and fashion this as the more elaborate of the two. The one in February does not go away. It's still there, but it does mm-hmm. seem as if there's more of a push to ink guys now. What's interesting Correct. to me is is that we don't fully know the effects of this new schedule quite yet. Nobody really knows how it's going to shake out. It might take a few recruiting cycles to figure out what this is going to be, how this needs to be modified to be more effective in the future. One early read, though, and Bud Elliott, God bless him, he's been predicting this since, I think, the summertime. He said a while back he thought small schools might see a benefit from this because, as you know, there are a lot of these fringe guys who traditionally have waited around to see if they get offered from bigger programs. In this setup, it almost forces them to make a decision earlier in the process. And in a lot of cases, that'll be to a place like ECU or Kansas over waiting around to go to Texas, waiting around to see if you get something from Florida, so on and so forth. So again, a lot remains to be seen about how this whole thing shakes out. It is interesting, though, that we're kind of flying blind through at least cycle number one of this. Yeah, and it affects guys who perhaps have had injuries later on in their career. Sure, and senior yeah. tape isn't fully out. I know Florida allegedly asked, uh, I think, ECU. That would be ECU, not TCU, East Carolina's. Their quarterback now, I believe, signee or at least commit to sort of hold off. Whereas if you're a three-star kid, even a promising three-star kid who may might be fringe, power five, group of five, whatever the case may be, when you're not as in demand, you want to grab that spot. So I know I was talking to our pal Yogi Roth about this. Carter Bradley, who is the son of former, I think, Jacksonville Jaguar head coach, Gus Bradley. Gus Bradley, right. Promising young quarterback, I think a high three-star kid, instead of waiting on perhaps to see if if a bigger program misses on a quarterback of choice, and there have some big programs who have missed in this past few weeks for quarterbacks scrambling late, he signed with Toledo because that is a guaranteed spot. He, I guess he feels the most wanted there. I can't speak to his exact feelings, but you know, certainly Toledo, promising program with Logan Woodside succeeding, Jason Candle just getting an extension. So guys are just, they're grabbing those spots and they don't want to be backup plans because sometimes backup plans don't work out. You know, those spots don't open up like schools are, are thinking that they might. So yeah, I think you're, you're totally right that those, those three-star kids who ordinarily might get that last second Ohio State or UCLA off or something like that, they're not waiting. They're grabbing their spot and they're they're no, moving on with their lives. Hey, a bird in hand, right? Versus two Absolutely. in the bush. I think that's what we're going to see, at least, again, as it relates to some of these fringe guys who could wait around and get a, an offer from a bigger school. 
The other thing that seems obvious is that there's a downside for you and I, and you alluded to this, but we are a once a week podcast. And given the fact that this is, that this is a rolling three day thing, we're going to do our best to cover a 30,000 foot view for now. We're going to give you major storylines and team rankings and key names and things like that. We will come back in February. We'll talk to you about how things all ended up. Keep yep. in mind that we are still trying to figure this whole thing out as well. So with that being said, Daniel, after at least one day of this new signing period, give me a sense for how the team rankings are looking. Any surprises? What are what are the early takeaways from how teams are doing now? I don't think there's all that much in the way of surprises. Ohio State has been putting together a behemoth of a class. Clemson has, when I say finished, I mean, they have sort of approached the end of the cycle in a very strong fashion. I think they've ended up with four of the top nine recruits in the country. Trevor Lawrence, who a lot of people have been very intrigued by for a number of years now, a big quarterback from, I want to say, Georgia. Great hair. 6'6", 215, an unbelievable head of hair. He's he's never allowed to cut that hair. (laughs) Uh, Xavier Thomas, I think a a defensive end as with, as is KJ Henry, a defensive end from, uh, from the Clemson class. And then Jackson Carmen, who is the sort of early story of the day for, you know, seemingly exciting reasons, but honestly not all that exciting because it was, he told a story about (sighs) urban Meyer allegedly being on the downside, the back half of his career, according to Dabo Swinney during his recruitment. Uh, Jackson Carmen being the number one recruit in the state of Ohio, a, a giant offensive lineman. I don't know that Dabo Swinney was incorrect. I don't know that there's anything so controversial about a coach pointing something out that may be true. And there's some solid evidence that you could point to, I suppose. Uh, just the the fact that Ohio, a, a huge high school football state, lost the number one recruit to a, a school in the South, I think is pretty significant. Yeah, big one, big one. That was one of the true surprises of the day what's the top 10 so we have ohio state georgia texas and georgia has finished extraordinarily yeah i want to talk about them next the end yeah a lot of linemen five-star linemen just coming to georgia in droves uh texas may have i know our our pal bud said this maybe the best defensive back class anybody's had ever they got a commitment (laughs) from a five-star kid named anthony cook so they're in the top they'll probably finish top two, three, four, somewhere in there. Penn State has finished very strong. Micah Parsons, who you remember, recently Ohio State had to stop recruiting as part of a a self-imposed disciplinary thing for improper contact with Kirk Herbstreet on the game day (laughs) set. An incredible story, by the way. Alabama, in a shocker, is finishing strong and should continue to climb. Miami's had a very strong class this whole time. Notre Dame, a very strong class. Uh, Oklahoma, impressive given it's Lincoln Riley's. I don't even know if it's his first full class because he took over in June, June. I want to say. June, yeah. So uh, certainly a, a pretty cool accomplishment from Lincoln Riley. Auburn, Clemson. Washington, who I believe brings in two blue chip quarterbacks, so always interesting there, including one of whom was a uh, an Oregon commitment to Mark Helfrich. Michigan is finishing pretty well. Oregon has fallen from that top six or seven perch, but they're still in the top 15. Florida got a huge commitment from an Ohio State quarterback. Emory commit Jones, names. yeah. Emory Jones, yeah, to Dan Mullen. So, you know, you have to look at, admire, I guess, the thinking of Emory Jones, like, wow, Urban Meyer's going to run me a lot. I better go to Dan Mullen, who's going to <laughs> run me a lot in warmer weather. Well, let me, <laughs> let's go back to Georgia. We'll get to Emory Jones yes. here, but okay. Georgia, I thought was a pretty big story. One of the hot names in this recruiting class was Justin Fields. Justin Fields is a quarterback. Originally, it sounded like he was going to Penn State. He decommitted from Penn State. He ends up signing with Georgia. Also at Georgia, we've got one of the top running backs, Zamir White. We've also got Dalvin Cook's little brother, James Cook. We've got Jamari Salyer on the line. Cade Mays on the line. Probably the best offensive line class in the entire country. And at least according to 24-7's composite, six five-star recruits on the board for Georgia just in day one. What is day one? (laughs) <laughs> of this new early signing period. That is a haul and a half for Kirby Smart, who clearly now, after making the playoff, after having a good recruiting class a year ago, seems like, okay, this is what it's going to be year in and year out. Maybe not quite as high as we're seeing this year, but if you're a Georgia fan, you've got a lot of reason to be really excited. What I don't get, though, 
<laughs> Not to take all the air out of the room here, but if you're Justin Fields and you see that Jake Fromm right. is a freshman starting, could potentially lead the dogs to a national championship, mm-hmm. what is the allure of going to Georgia? Well, he's from Georgia, so there is the idea of staying somewhere close. I mean, what is the allure of any five-star coming in a year after another blue-chip quarterback? We've seen it at other places. Tua Tagovailoa has gotten on the field at Alabama after uh, you know Jalen Hurts succeeded to, to a pretty crazy extent as a true freshman. The, honestly, what did... Why did Jake Fromm go when Jacob Eason was there? Well, transfers happen. Injuries happen. You know, yeah. life happens. And if Justin Fields truly felt, and I say this as somebody who has never spoken to him, <laughs> has no insider knowledge of the inner workings of his brain, but if he feels that he felt most at home at Georgia, like the coaches at Georgia the most, and feels like he has an honest-to-goodness shot to compete at some point, probably doesn't expect to come in in 2018 and win the job, but... If he expects to come in and prove himself, and I, again, no inside knowledge of anybody's brain, but Jacob Eason, who knows how long he is for Athens after seeing perhaps some writing on the wall with Jake Fromm's success as a true freshman, life happens, and you just got to follow your heart. You remember Georgia did this a few years ago now with Zach Mettenberger and Aaron yeah, Murray, sure, and that ultimately worked out for everybody. Aaron Murray had a, a record-setting career for the Dogs, and Zach Mettenberger went on to have a, a pretty good transfer. He played. Year he played for, for the LSU. Titans. He played for the Titans. It did. You know, Aaron Murray's brother got on the Bachelor. The I want to say yeah. it's yeah, all yeah. happening. Sure. Okay. So, at at a certain point, I mean, Washington signed two. I think Texas signed a couple of well-regarded quarterbacks. Michigan has a couple of pretty good quarterbacks in this class, and you need numbers and all of these guys are ultra competitive and believe that they can come in and just power wash the depth chart. So well, I, who am I? I don't think it's always the brightest decision. I think uh, Justin Fields had an opportunity at Florida state and given the coaching change, maybe he was turned off. I don't know. Maybe he was more of a, a Jimbo guy. I I get it. I get why you want to go where you want to go. I don't know if he really saw an opportunity that he really loved elsewhere. So either way, it feels like it'll be entertaining. What a ridiculous class for Georgia. It feels like it'll be entertaining, and to your point, yeah, an incredible haul. Let's stay in the SEC and briefly Mm -hmm. talk about Florida flipping Emory Jones from Ohio State. Emory Jones, a dual-threat quarterback, it's a big deal for two reasons. A, you may have watched Florida play quarterback this season, Mm -hmm. and B, Emory Jones sort of fits in perfectly with the system that Dan Mullen wants to run at Florida. Definitely. I mean, they also signed four safeties, a couple of tight ends, some some linemen, maybe not quite as much sex appeal elsewhere, although it was a very strong class in its own right. But Emory Jones, getting him from Ohio State, I think gives Dan Mullen someone he's going to start from day one to run that system. I don't know where it leaves a guy like a Felipe Franks, who played a lot this year. He was only a true freshman, but Emory Jones, to me, Seems like he fits more with what Dan Mullen wants to do in Gainesville. Yeah, and I don't think this class is complete. They're they're what a top fifteen class right now, and the Emory Jones thing is huge. I know they have a couple of uh, let's see. When you look at their their commitments, it's a pretty good defensive class. It's pretty balanced. I know Damian Pierce is a well regarded running back, but there's still time to add more more players because Dan Mullen and his new staff they're still forging sort of very new and quick relationships with high school coaches and recruits that perhaps they weren't in on at Mississippi state or wherever any of these assistants were last year. So it's sort of, it it seems fluid, but he signed a a good chunk of these guys and there's a a healthy percentage of blue chips. It looks like maybe perhaps skewed a little bit more on defense, depending on where a couple of athletes end up. But yeah, all in all, it seems like a, a successful first stab at things for Dan Mullen and the Florida staff. Let's talk about Penn state. Penn State's a a program, obviously near and dear to my heart. They get a top pass rusher in Micah Parsons, who is from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It sounds like James Franklin's going to give him some time at middle linebacker in the spring. We'll see how that pans out for him, but he's a very talented player. They also add in a big-bodied five-star wideout from New Jersey, Justin Shorter. He's going to major in engineering, Dan. The smart oh, yeah. cookie, so he'll be a nice addition. They get Ricky Slade from Virginia, a five-star all-purpose back, and they also flip Jahad Dotson, a four-star wideout from 
right up the road from me here in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. He flipped over from UCLA. The most interesting nugget I saw all day regarding Penn State came from our friend Bruce Feldman, who said that in the previous four years before Coach Franklin, Penn State had 17 combined four- and five-star signees. In the four years with Franklin, Penn State now has signed 45 four- and five-star recruits. Say what you want about Franklin, but Franklin's been really good at going out, getting new coordinators when he knew he needed to change the system, and also building this program somewhat from the ground up in his image on the recruiting trail. He's been a dogged recruiter, and he's done a hell of a job. The numbers speak for themselves. 45, Dan. Wow. That is, it is incredible, and the best teams win with the best players. That is sort of a reality of things. And on the same token, you understand why Penn State may have been radioactive during sure. the Bill oh, yeah, O'Brien and the end of Joe Pa. So certainly, I don't think that's a commentary on what Penn State can do to attract when things look as good as they can in State College. And I, I know they, they had a quarterback come in last year, right? Not in this class. Uh, a More of a pro-style guy. It looks like his name is Sean Clifford, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So, no, it's it's good times. Some other tidbits that I found interesting for the first time since 2013. You mentioned Texas and what they're doing in the defensive backfield. Mm-hmm. Uh, they signed the top recruit in the state of Texas. He was a safety. But the fact that they're doing it for the first time since 2013 is, I don't know, it's a testament to something. It's a feel-good story if you're a Texas fan. It's a right. gentleman by the name of B.J. Foster. He Mm -hmm. gives them, uh, you know, I guess a front man in their class of right now what is like four safeties, four defensive backs. It's a top five class at worst. And I think if you compare that year over year, last year Texas in a bit of a, a state of flux after they got rid of Charlie Strong and hired Tom Herman. Now Tom Herman has a full recruiting cycle. And it seems like, again, a really good class for Texas. Yes, looks like an excellent class for Texas, and you're right. And I know there have been sort of stories trickling out, at least rumors, that you know p- perhaps Tom Herman's rubbing high school coaches and recruits in Texas the wrong way. But if you look at his class, yep. and he is a, a, worked out. attracting enough talent. All right. Uh, Notre Dame, shamelessly, I need to talk about Notre Dame. Please. A, a, a defensive focus. Okay. I think so far... Houston Griffith, Derek Allen in the defensive backfield, Jack Lamb, Shane Smith, Matthew Bauer, some other talent along uh, the linebacking core, defensive line, offensive line, got two big wideouts. The big name to watch is going to be Phil Jerkovic. He is the dual threat guy that we mentioned on the last show. He's from Western PA, a big kid, a little bit of a wonky delivery, kind of reminds me of Henry from Rookie of the Year. Okay. A little bit, but talented guy. A good runner, a good passer. He's enrolling early. I don't think you'll see him jump up from number four on the depth chart to any serious contention with Brandon Wimbush, but he's an exciting prospect and a name that I would expect you'd hear a lot about before long. Certainly, if it's not in 2018, then he starts getting mentions for time. 2019 after Wimbush could be... An interesting bet for you. So we have Avery Davis, Ian Book. Ian Book was the backup, yep. Right, and Wimbush, you know, entrenched, we assume, as a starter. And listen, the drive for 51%, Ty, it starts today. (laughs) It starts today. It starts today. Oh, okay. What else is going on? What other nuggets? I would assume Alabama is going to keep building. They got a big uh, speed rusher from Baltimore uh, to, to sort of... Inc. today. His name is, I am going to screw this up, but I think it's Ayabi Anoma. Yeah, sure. From Baltimore, a highly coveted defensive end. Um, it looks like a lot of defense, especially along the defensive line. Cameron Latu, I know a defensive end from out west in Utah, who's who's pretty well regarded. Tommy Brown, an offensive lineman from out west. I know a lot of teams in the Pac-12 wanted him. So it looks like a very solid class. And honestly, if this class only finishes like number four, number five, that's still, given the attrition on the coaching staff for Alabama these past couple of years, it's Billy not Napier, bad. Mari Cristobal, losing Jeremy Pruitt, Lane Kiffin, and Steve Sarkeesian. Like, this is the, the fact that they're able to overhaul and the power of Alabama and the power of Nick Saban. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, but 
still, it's easier said than done, and they are consistently doing they're, it. They're consistently among the top in the country. I don't expect that would change anytime soon. But you did talk about coaching attrition, and it was a very active coaching carousel this season. Do we have any sense for the newer coaches out there and yeah. how they fared, at least on day one of this new signing period? Well, we mentioned Dan Mullen and how things seem pretty solid in Gainesville. Willie Taggart, I would imagine it's sort of resting in the weeds right now. Their class is very low, but I know they're working on those former Oregon commitments from the state of Florida, and it looks like at least a couple of them will be making the switch to Florida State. And I know as of the time we're recording this, I think there's a talented safety from Southern California who they feel good about. We'll see. I think his last name is Woodbay, Jalen Woodbay, maybe. Um, And he's also looking at USC and Ohio State. So what I would imagine is Willie Taggart is, rightfully so, counting on getting a number of visits and a lot of time to sway some undecided kids in January, maybe a couple more during this signing period. So I would imagine it's sort of a a distance race right now for Florida State. Chip Kelly has managed to hold on to at least a couple of big guys at UCLA. He got a big receiver from the state of Oregon to come down a couple a couple days ago, Chase Coda, who's an Oregon legacy. And they, they flipped a big USC linebacker, Bo Calvert, linebacker commitment. Um, Jimbo Fisher at Texas a m It's been sort of an offensive line and receiver focus right now. And obviously he's still putting together a staff. They're still working on bowl preparation, whatever. So I imagine he will be making an attempt to, uh, to at least flip or get in the ears of a number of kids in Texas in January, Mario Cristobal, a couple of late defensive line signings today that were not surprises, I don't think, but they committed and signed today. But he was the big thing for Cristobal and his staff, aside from keeping the staff basically together, other than the assistance that Willie Taggart brought over from USF, is that he held on to a couple of really big fish, including Tyler Shuck, who is considered to be, and that's how you pronounce it, Ty, S-H-O-U-G-H. Okay. Shuck. Like Shuck. what you would do to an oyster. Sure. Um So he's from Arizona and the top player there. So a top quarterback decided to stay with Oregon. That was a huge need after we saw what Oregon did with their backup quarterbacks this past year. Uh, Chad Morris signed perhaps the best name in the 2018 class. And it's the best player in this class. Bumper. Bumper. Bumper Bumper the thumper at inside linebacker. And he is a quarterback in this class, which always helps to sort of get a kid from day one. Jeremy Pruitt, couple blue chip defensive linemen up front, big dudes, has a California quarterback coming in, not necessarily a blue chip, but he has managed to hold on to him. JT Shrout, Scott Frost had a late, speaking of Tennessee, uh, blue chip quarterback, Adrian Martinez, who I actually think is from California, had committed to Tennessee and maybe Cal before that. He's coming to Nebraska, so Scott Frost gets his blue chip quarterback in a solid defensive class and obviously has the assistance coming over from UCF. So there is not a lot to learn and sort of about working together and recruiting with them. Herm Edwards has, Oh no, don't talk about Herm. Not much. <laughs> what is going on at ASU? So the last time, yeah, I think we talked about Herm Edwards and the ASU debacle. Mm-hmm. ASU sort of bought in to what seems to be, like a multi-level marketing scheme, basically, that they they had cracked the code, they hacked the matrix on a new athletics model. And it seemed as if the bedrock of that model was bringing in Herm to manage from a higher level to retain the coordinators that were with Todd Graham in 2017 and to sort of plot forward. Well, yes. when we last left our heroes, that was the case. Now... Both coordinators are essentially gone, and it's looking more and more like a bit of a tire fire out there in Tempe. Indeed. And Todd Graham is still coaching the bowl game the last time I checked. So <laughs> all sorts of weirdness. No, it's not a particularly great class. Maybe they finish strong. Maybe they, they identify some diamonds in the rough once they get their coordinator situation in order. But it, it was strange. Herm Edwards spending the the final contact week, I guess, of the, the recruiting period before signing day working at ESPN, not making in-home visits. It was very strange that as soon as you're hired, especially with this new early signing day, you you should be living on a plane. You should be living in airports and in living rooms and on rental car back seats, whatever. And Herm Edwards was just, you know, talking about the NFL on ESPN. They out-hipstered themselves or something with this decision. Oh, 
Yeah, I mean, everybody's talking about how, well, ASU is remodeling and restructuring to be like an NFL team. They just didn't tell everybody it was to be the Browns. The Browns, that is, yeah. They're, wow. They're, they're Cleveland South. Um, on a more positive... Uh, Please, how, we need something. I say that just because we admire him from afar. New York's one true team, Fordham, and of course, your alma mater, Penn State's very own, Joe Moorhead. A very good, he's been he's been able to hold on to a very good wide receiver yes. class, including the number one JUCO receiver in the country, Stephen Guidry, who at one point was going to go to LSU. Uh, Jalen Maiden, a, a dual threat quarterback, is going to Mississippi State. He, of course, is the younger brother of, I want to say, a former Alabama, or not former, but a current Alabama corner, uh, Jared Maiden. So, it, it, an intriguing class to start things out. We'll see. Hope, hoping for the best for a competitive team for Joe Moorhead. What is it? It's more cowbell. That we're talking about more, more cowbell. More cowbell. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're going um, for. Otherwise, around the country just in general, well, any thoughts about any of those guys, classes, progress? It's good to see Jomo holding it together at Mississippi State. He's going to be an interesting guy to follow because he is so smart with the X's and O's. I think he'll give some teams, at least one team, one higher level team in the SEC West some trouble come September. Yes. Uh, Maryland got, and this is not a recruit, but Byron Cowart, the former number one overall yeah. I believe, player sure. in the 20, I want to say 15 class who followed Will Muschamp from Florida to Auburn for his one year as a defensive coordinator is now transferring to Maryland. So I think he's from Florida, went to Auburn, now is transferring to Maryland. And Maryland, by the way, the Terps for all their top 20 bitten. Yeah, they have a top 20 class right now. Could get higher. So yeah, I saw that. I cool saw Maryland. I saw Virginia Tech is having a, a really good class. I saw that mm -hmm. Minnesota is kind of yeah. on the cusp of having its first ever top 25 class now under PJ Flex. So some interesting names and teams to follow as we, again, plot ahead here. It is the early signing period now. There is mm -hmm. more recruiting. There will be more announcements, certainly when we roll around to February in 2018. But... Uh, for now, I, I think that's a pretty good breakdown of what's going on around college football. Yeah. I mean, USC is sort of lurking on the outside. They're around 30, but I imagine they're going to have a, a pretty big jump as they close more and more. And certainly they're going to get them later on in today and tomorrow and the, the following day yeah. and, and in February. So I anticipate them, I since that they will close strong, excuse me. And just quickly, uh, a note about we, we said the term blue chip and top kid and all these things a lot. And I know a lot of people are quick to say things like the star rankings don't matter. Look at this team and this specific player who was a two star and a three star like that. That's fine. There are exceptions, but because we've gotten better and better about seeing more film and, you know, there are more, more eyes on film because of YouTube and huddle and all these things the the star rankings have never actually been, more, I would say more accurate and definitely more thorough. And, you know, our pal Bud and there's a business around it now. Sure. You know, there is a business. And we're, we, we're we follow the, the money, on. right? Follow the money. <laughs> there's more being poured into evaluating these kids. And I think as a whole, and we've talked to Brandon Huffman, we talked to Bud Elliott. We're going to put out probably in February our much awaited show on how recruiting works. And in that mm -hmm. show, we talk pretty extensively about why recruiting rankings have gotten much more accurate over the last 15 to 20 years. And yeah, a lot of it is because of the resource. And there's just so much, there's such a infrastructure around rating these kids that it doesn't matter per se, but it's definitely a pretty accurate indication of how someone's going to translate to the next level. Yeah, and there's, there's more camps, there's seven on seven, there's the big, you know, the Nike opening out in Portland where you get to see a top offensive lineman from, say, Tennessee against a top defensive lineman from Utah. Right. Those are things because yeah. of level of competition at a certain place you wouldn't necessarily always get to see. And quickly tie blue chips, so four and five star kids, are almost a thousand percent more likely to be drafted in the first round than non-blue chips. Um, so that's five more. Stars, that's definitely that more. That is more likely. Yeah, right. Five stars are about 33 times as likely to be all Americans as two stars are. And there are a lot of two stars. And yet the five stars just get those spots. They grab those spots. So and, and national championship wise. And these are teams, you know, the teams that we've spent the most time on Ohio State, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Notre Dame. These are teams that have been in the national championship recently, have won national championships recently. And every national champion in the ratings era. So since like rivals and scout and ESPN and 24 seven, blah, 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 have 
put out rankings on everybody. Every national champion has had at least 50% of their team be a blue chip recruit or above, I guess. So a four or five star. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, the, the data is pretty <laughs> clear at this point. Ty. I think, I think the data is very clear. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. For recruiting again, this is going to be a bit of a fluid situation. It's really only day one again of this new early signing period. Much intrigue about where it leaves the state of recruiting in college football. We'll do our best to cover it along the way here. Perhaps talk about it next week before we get into some of our bigger bowl previews. But for now, that seems to be the lay of the land. Dan, before we go any further, yes, before we talk about bowl games, before we talk about Lane Kiffin and his colossal 50-3 to victory just to try and end some of the trash talking, Mm-hmm. from Akron's athletic department. We need to talk about our friends over at Casper. I, I would love to. I have a lot of experience on their beautiful mattresses. I, I do as well. Casper, in case you don't know, they're a sleep brand. They continue to revolutionize their line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. They've got three mattress models. They've got the original, the Wave, and the Essential. Casper mattresses are all perfectly designed to soothe and cradle Ooh. your body's natural geometry, not to mention the breathable design. It helps you sleep cool. It regulates your body temperature all throughout the night, and it's delivered right to your door in a small, how did they do that sized box? <laughs> they give you free shipping. You get returns in the United States and Canada. The best part is you can be sure of your purchase because they give you 100 nights Risk free. You can sleep on it, try it out, see if you like it. If not, it's a risk free return. You spend one third of your life sleeping. You should at least be comfortable. I won't go into elaborate details on this, Dan, but I was having serious shoulder and neck and back issues on the old sponge that I used to sleep on that came over from the Solid Wife's apartment. Uh, Casper was so kind as to send us a model. I have not had any of those issues ever since. Nice. It's been a, a full 180 for me just physically as, of course, a uh, hardworking podcaster. I got to tell you, I mean, I haven't really said this on the show before, but every time I've seen you in the last few months, you know, it's, hey, how you doing? What's new? And every time you say, you know what it is? There's something. Casper just understands my natural body geometry. That's right, Dan. And I'm astounded that 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 is that has struck such a chord with you. And I got my Casper mattress. I tend to agree, Ty. The angles, the the rhombi on my body are very happy. I'm like a foot taller now. It's incredible. <laughs> Your spine has never looked better. Start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. You can get 50 bucks towards any mattress purchase right now by visiting casper.com slash verbal. And then when they ask you at checkout... Enter verbal again if you want to get, again, $50 off your mattress purchase. Casper.com slash verbal. Offer code verbal. Terms and conditions do apply. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about some of the bowl games that have already taken place. We won't waste too much time talking about this, Dan, but as you know, we've got a bowl pool going on. We've had, what, seven games already That have been played. We've got one that's going on, I think, as we speak and record Mm -hmm. our podcast this evening. Let me run through those very quickly. Because we've got, we want to take like an hour to discuss the Camellia Bowl, right? Sure, of course. We really want to stretch out our national body, our natural body geometries. Here is what transpired so far in bowl season. We had North Carolina A and T 21 to 14 over Grambling. Boise 38 to 28 over Oregon. We'll talk about the seven turnovers in a minute. Sure. Troy wins by 20, 50 to 30 over North Texas. Georgia State gets their first bowl win over Western Kentucky by a 27 to 17 final. Marshall wins 31 to 28 in a close one over Colorado State. Middle Tennessee by five over Arkansas State and the Red Wolves. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, Florida Atlantic and Lane Kiffin 50 to three over the Akron Zips. Okay. Before we talk about Lane's 10-year contract. You want to talk about Cherubundi Tart Cherries. 
I want to talk about seven turnovers in the Las Vegas Bowl. Sure. I okay. So I can't speak in great detail this to this game because that was when Camera Guy Dave was getting ready, and so I was in the room with him and his friends, and then the wedding happened, and so I was back and forth. So this was watched on a TV part of the time, on my phone part of the time, not at all part of the time. I can tell you this: Oregon did not look particularly good. Does not sound like you missed game. a whole lot, Dan. No, I missed Brett Rippon completing a lot of passes and a couple picks. Uh, Oregon did a, a pretty good job against the run. Justin Herbert looked just flat, just did not look. I mean, this was a lot of the Oregon offense. Royce Freeman was there, but didn't play, which was a little bit strange. And Oregon just, they couldn't run it at all. They kept going three and out. I, I'm not going to ask you to play the music because it hurts me so much about you know the drive performances of Oregon. But if you look at the chart, I'm seeing punt, punt, fumble, fumble, punt, interception, interception, fumble, punt, punt, punt to start out their first nine or ten drives. So it maybe it was a literal hangover for Oregon. Maybe it was getting used to Mario Cristobal. But the fact of the matter remains, from Justin Herbert on down, this was, it was a pretty ugly performance. Though I will say, Ty, you say Oregon lost by ten. But I see Oregon's offense and Oregon's defense all knotted up at 14 (laughs) because Oregon's offense only scored 14. Two quick defensive touchdowns before halftime or else this game would have been superbly ugly for for the Ducks. So great win from Boise State. Brett Rippon was really good. The defense, they kept showing Boise's middle linebacker seemed like a thousand times and, you know, rightfully so. He was very good. But uh, good win for Boise to finish out the year, winning their conference and beating a major team. And... uh... On the Florida Atlantic front, I mentioned Lane Kiffin now has a 10-year contract with FAU. We don't know what his buyout is yet, but what it amounts to is basically FAU will take him as coach for as long as he wants to stay in Boca. And that's fine. 300 bucks. Yeah, 300 that, bucks. It I mean, look. This was a pretty good year for Florida Atlantic. Yeah. They obviously win the bowl game, finished with what? 11 wins, something crazy. This was a good year for Lane Kiffin. I don't know if and when he'll move on. At some point, he probably will. A 10-year contract that keeps him there through 2027 is certainly a bit of a leap of faith. However, when you're FAU, you got to try stuff. And I admire it. He did a good job this season. In the bowl game, went for it a bunch on fourth down. Was trying to, I guess, get back at, what was it, the AD for Akron, whom Lane claimed had some trash talk. For the Owls. Owls. So Owls. 50 to three was your final score. Yeah, they finished the season winning what? 10 straight games after losing a couple. I mean, to, you know, Navy and Wisconsin and the Buffalo loss is sort of inexcusable. But yeah, hell of a year for for FAU. And at some point, some team, be it at a bigger, bigger group of five place or a power five place, We'll know perhaps the Lane Kiffin is not healthy for them, but they just have that craving, Ty. Yo, yeah. Lane Kiffin will end up somewhere. All right. On that note. Dan, Ty, help. I need picks of the week. At long last, we get to our bowl previews, Dan. Yeah. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten games to discuss here this evening. Hope everyone's doing well in their bowl pool. Perhaps on our next show, we'll give everyone an update as to where the standings are Mm -hmm. in our confidence pool. For now, though, let's start with the Foster Farms Bowl. They played this one in Levi's Stadium in Santa Clara, California. It's played on December 27th at 8.30 p.m. on Fox. It is a close matchup, and I say close because the Arizona Wildcats are only about a field goal favorite over the Purdue Boiler Makers. Daniel, what is our gift situation for the Foster Farms Bowl? Ty, I'm glad you asked. So, Purdue players, Arizona players, will be walking away with a fossil watch. Okay. Solid. Yeah. Sony XB950N1 extra bass noise canceling headphones. Ooh, that's a mouthful. I think that's a great gift. Sure. I would love to have that, especially big Bluetooth here. Big Bluetooth year if you're a Purdue player. You got a long flight on back to Indiana. Sony Sony headphones sound like a good thing to have. A Timbuktu backpack. Ty, I have a Timbuktu messenger bag. Really? And and it's downright, it's indestructible. It's a good bag. I gotta okay. tell you. Good bag. Coin. So there's that. A coin? Um, Do you say coin? coin? 
coin. It just says the word coin. Not so Bitcoin, some sort of just a regular coin. Regular ass coin. And this game is, it's Santa Clara, right? It's not San Francisco. Levi's it's Stadium. Levi's Dan. Stadium, which yeah. is a bit of a bummer. I'd much rather play at AT&T. Good garlic fries. Uh, and a $25 Apple iTunes gift card. So okay. I'm thinking this is in like the B plus A minus range. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. This is a potentially fun game. Everyone yes. knows about Khalil Tate. He's going to have a hard time running in this game. If he brings his arm, the arm could be a problem for Purdue. Mm-hmm. Purdue's not been great against the pass, but Purdue very quietly, a top 30 defense, sort of been my pet team all year. They've not disappointed me. Unlike Notre Dame, I didn't really have any expectations for Purdue. Right. And therefore, I've never been disappointed by them the entire year through. So I'm inclined to go Purdue here, plus the points. Let's take them outright to the tune of 20 confidence points. Ooh, Tyler. I dig it. Um, Yeah, Arizona, they had the big win against Wazoo, but aside from that, there was nothing that big. The loss to ASU in the Territorial Cup was not great. You mentioned Khalil Tate. The rest of the backfield's wonderful. The defense is pretty bad, but they do a good job keeping bigger passes in front, but that's not how Purdue wins. You know, Purdue had, you know, losing to Rutgers in Nebraska, not a, not a great way to sort of back half of the season. It, you know, they had good wins against Ohio, Mizzou and Iowa and Indiana early on, but yeah, you're right. That defense is great, especially against the run just completely lights out. And they did, they ran pretty well. So I, with the ability to run and stop the run, I think Purdue's in a good position. I like the Boilers here. Not as confident because I think Khalil Tate can bust something or six. So I'm going to say Purdue with about a 13-14 confidence level. I'm feeling confident in Purdue and their defense and in my boy Elijah Sindelar. Sindelar. I'm going Purdue here. I think the Sindelarity happens in this game. (laughs) It's real bad. Sindelarity. Yeah, thank you. Uh Let's go Purdue outright. We agree. We agree. Let's go to the Academy Sports and Outdoors Texas Bowl. That's a weird sponsor, Dan. Um, Yeah, it doesn't sound like they probably had to pay a lot. Academy Sports and Outdoors Texas Bowl in the NERG Energy Stadium in Houston. Also on December 27th, this one at 9 p.m. on ESPN. We've got the Missouri Tigers a three-point favorite Mm -hmm. over the Texas Longhorns. Dan, what's the gift situation here, please? I had to learn what Academy Sports was. It's sort of like somewhere between a Dick's Sporting Goods and a Cabela's. Sporting Goods, hunting stuff, kind of thing like that. Uh, There is a gift suite. um, Academy Sports and Outdoors gift card, which seems pretty good. Seems relevant. Adidas duffel bag and a belt buckle. Uh, They're doing the Texas thing, aren't they? The belt buckle thing. If it's just like the the buckle is some sort of like the the Texas star or something like that, that's pretty good. If it's an Academy Sports logo, yeah, nobody's going to wear that. <laughs> Where would you wear, wear a Texas belt buckle right now in your everyday life? Would you wear that to work? If it were like a star or like some sort of horns or some sort of cowboy type thing. You would wear that with your cowboy boots to work? I probably would not. Maybe I would wear it to something like the Piesman. As just sort of a goof, but I don't see myself wearing. Uh, I think a belt buckle would overwhelm my my pretty weak waist. So I would agree with that. Yeah, mine yeah. as well. So Dan, look, uh, this game is in Texas, which means it's mm-hmm. a virtual home game. It's called the Texas Bowl for crying out loud. So, yeah, at least that I think favors the Longhorns. But while nobody mm-hmm. was paying attention, Missouri was ripping off six in a row. They, they close out the year. They put an offense together, 43 touchdowns for Drew Locke at quarterback, a good rushing attack with Ish Witter, Jamon Moore as the senior leader on an otherwise young wide receiving core. There was a lot to like there. Mm-hmm. However, if the boys in the truck could could just lay down <laughs> that bed of classical music for me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Dan, here's the S&P rank of each of the teams that Missouri beat this season. Oh, I'm excited. Not ranked. 98. 119. 87. 107. 81. 92. (laughs) 
not the toughest I, I, of competition there in their uh, seven victories that I just yeah, described. Yeah, and not their fault. Not their fault necessarily. They beat who was in front of them in the second half of the year. But you're right. Vanderbilt was their signature win. They played three teams inside the top 40, and they got mauled by all of them. I am absolutely going to take Texas in this football game. It's a home game. Uh, I don't feel superbly confident about it, but quite honestly, I back myself into a corner with some of my other confidence picks. So we're going to go Texas. (laughs) We're going to stand by them outright, and we're just going to go with 21 confidence points on it. I disagree. Mostly because Texas's big win was Iowa State with Jacob Park by not a lot. West Virginia with mostly no Will Greer. Kansas State. I, I don't I don't love Texas. They finished the season losing to Texas Tech relative to their talent. That offense was kind of a nightmare. I don't know who's starting at quarterback in this game. The defense was terrific, particularly against the run. Their pass defense was good. But really, they were led by their rush defense. Missouri is going to throw the ball around a ton. And I listen, their pass D is not bad. Missouri's their rush D, they could not stop the run. Texas couldn't run the ball. That sort of cancels everything out. It's a problem. Me. It's a definite problem. I think I like Drew Locke. I think I like the Mizzou momentum, the Mizentum. Mm. So I think I'm going to go Mizzou here, not with a lot of confidence picks, but upper teens, maybe 17, 18 points. I'm going Mizzou. We disagree. Let's move we on. Disagree. Let's talk about the military oh, bowl. Oh, got one thing, because this is a podcast for service. Uh, if you are going to this game, if you're going to be in Houston, Houston's an outstanding food city. You should eat everything you can possibly eat. My recommendation, maybe the best sit down Mexican meal I've ever had. Hugo's Hugo. Go to Hugo's. So friggin great. Let's move on to the okay. Military Bowl presented by Northrop. Is it Grumman or Grumman? I always get this Grumman. wrong. Grumman. It's that second M in there, huh? <laughs> they play it at Memorial Stadium in Annapolis. They play it on December 28th at 1.30 in the p.m. Eastern Standard, Eastern Daylight Time, whatever it is, on ESPN. Standard, I believe we're in right now. We've got Virginia. About a one, one and a half point favorite over the Navy midshipmen who are, again, playing a home game. The numbers, Dan, they say that this one's just about dead even. I guess it favors Navy that they're playing on their home turf. Does the gift situation give us any kind of lean here? Uh, So we have a Rock'em socks package. Okay. And Under Armour beanie and backpack. Under Armour, of course based in Maryland, so that sort of makes sense, and I imagine it will be cold, so that at least seems thoughtful, but that's all I have listed here. So no lean from the gifts, huh? No real lean lean from the gifts, no, not that Hmm. I can see. Um, Virginia played Georgia Tech earlier in the year, back at the beginning of November. They won that game 40-36 to over the Yellow Jackets. At a minimum, we know that they can handle a marginally better version of the Navy offense. And I think when you consider the fact that the Navy defense is decided garbage. Wow. I'm going to go Virginia here. I'm going to go Virginia. I'm going to go outright. I'm going to go to the tune of 22 confidence points. Yeah, that's certainly a choice. I think I'm going to disagree. So yes, Navy did lose to Army. Um, Navy did finish the season, what, losing... Five of six. Yeah. As far as I can tell, I think Virginia also ended the season. Lose? Did they also lose five of six to finish the year? They got the shut year. out so, to end the year. They did get shut out by uh, Virginia Tech. They got walloped 10 mm. Um To me, these teams seem relatively even, even. I think Virginia has the advantage with Kurt Bankert throwing against a extraordinarily bad pass defense from Navy, but Navy was pretty good against the run. Virginia can't really run it, so who knows what that actually means. But I think the best thing in this game is probably still, to me, even seeing the first two and a half quarters of Kurt Bankert versus uh, versus Miami, which was certainly impressive, is Zach Abey. He's a machine. I like him on the ground. I like the fact that it's a home game. I don't fully trust Virginia's defense. They gave up a lot of big runs this year, so I'm going to go with Navy. I'm huh. going Navy at home. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We disagree. Happy to disagree. Yeah, so uh, 2022, somewhere in there. The Camping World Bowl is up next. It's also on December the 28th. This one at 515. 
They played in Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida. It's on ESPN if you want to watch. It's Oklahoma State. A four and a half point favorite over Virginia Tech, Dan. What kind of gifts do they give from Camping World? I would think like a lot of portable canteens and <laughs> tents, things of that like. I'm seeing a timely watch company watch. Huh. It's fine. Okay. okay. You can use that when you go camping. Can you start a fire with that? Uh, yeah, I guess you could reflect sunlight off the face if you really knew what you were doing. Right, right, I'm right. Okay. That up. Sure. Uh, and 400 damn dollars to Best Buy. Wow. I'll take that. I will happily take that. See, now, Camping World is a place. It's a retailer, right? Mm-hmm. I think why, so. Sounds right. Why does Camping World give a $400 gift card out to a place other than Camping World? Um, it's a good question. You got to find something to entertain yourself with while you're camping. So maybe you buy some, I don't know, a Bluetooth speaker to listen out nature. Maybe you buy yourself some CDs. Do CDs still exist? I have no idea. Maybe they could. Um, <laughs> you could buy a lot of things. I don't know. Hmm. Washing machine. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. $400 isn't bad though to Best Buy. I'll I'd that. rather have... I'd rather have Best Buy. I'm not questioning this. I am legit interested in this football game because there is definitely a strength on strength component yep. in Oklahoma State's offense against a really good, really legit Virginia Tech defense. What troubles me, though, is when you look at Virginia Tech's offense, not any team out there can beat Pitt by only six. Not only team out there <laughs> can beat Virginia by a 10 to nil margin to close out the year rivalry or not i don't know how many points they can score on oklahoma state because there's a better chance than not that oklahoma state's going to score at least what 28 i don't care how good the tech defense is how many points can virginia tech score on offense because they've been somewhat lousy all year yeah and now no cam phillips their leading receiver he is out injured so not playing in this game not you know, having the big weapon for Josh Jackson, especially when Virginia Tech couldn't really run the ball with much consistency. That's hurtful, Ty. That is yeah. hurtful. Uh, we saw Oklahoma State score points against pretty much the best teams on their schedule, other than, you know, that weird Texas overtime game, in which they won 13 to 10. But other than that, if they did one thing well, it was score. It was move the ball. It got a little ugly at times in games like West Virginia, but they're able to turn it on late. I listen, the strength on strength thing is very real. And I don't know if Oklahoma State had any one big signature win. Iowa State, late, Texas Tech, late. I don't know. But they sort of go as their running backs go. Justice Hill had a, a mostly very good year. You know, passing game was just absurd. And Virginia Tech's defense, especially against the run, was great, which makes me think Virginia Tech has a chance. But ultimately, I, you're, you're right. I don't know how they consistently move the ball. They generated some big plays, but you know, to just go drive to drive, moving the ball down the field, putting themselves in position to score, they they certainly took a step back from where they were in 2016. So I'm going Oklahoma State just because I don't know if if point for point Virginia Tech can be there. I'm going to go Oklahoma State. I'm going to lay the four and a half. I'm going to take them outright to the tune of 35 confidence points. I, yeah, feel I was, pretty I was good. up at like 28, 29. Yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel pretty good about this one. Okay, let's move on to another game on December the 28th at 9 p.m. on ESPN. Yep. Between TCU and Stanford, TCU a two-and-a-half point favorite. In the Valero Alamo Bowl, they play it in the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas, Dan. Let's finish strong here. Okay. If you're me. Let's pick against TCU for just one more game this season, shall we? Listen, that's a choice you can make, sure. We had a very public breakup back in September. I, I stayed friends with TCU. I don't know if that's awkward, but like we're still cool. So it's it's really no way to live having the paparazzi <laughs> set up across the street day in and day out, but yeah, I'm holding firm. I am going to go stand for here. I am not at all confident. I am not at all interested <laughs> in watching this football game. So I'm going to go Stanford to the tune of six confidence points. I think probably a three-point game one way or the other. And I just like Bryce Love more than I do anything on the TCU side, more than I do Ken Hill, 
more than I do Gary Patterson or the TCU defense. Let's just go Stanford. Let's hold our nose and go with the Cardinal. Is he playing Bryce Love? I mean, I honestly don't know maybe? the answer as far uh, as I can tell. Uh, maybe? Yeah. So certainly Christian McCaffrey didn't play in his final game, but... Always sort of understand running backs, especially one like Bryce Love, who has NFL potential to succeed, given he was the clear best home run hitter in college football this season. I, I'm i going to go with TCU here just yeah. because Stanford is like squarely like they're clearly the, the 28th best team in the country or the, you know, the 20th best team, whatever. They do everything all right. Other than Bryce Love, that was their offense. Bryce Love was their offense. They don't have a bad loss on their schedule. They didn't sort of have an off week and lose to a team like, I don't know, Oregon when right. they were down or Arizona State or something like that. Stanford's like buying an Amazon Basics branded office chair. Yeah. You know, like it'll yes. it'll it'll go up and down, but it won't recline. It's just the basics, just the bare minimum that you need mm-hmm. to get by. Yeah, they're a club sandwich. Nobody has ever said you have to go out of your way and stop your road trip and drive 45 miles off the interstate for this club sandwich, and that's fine. Club sandwich, always solid, always good, always a great option. Uh, Stanford, their their defense was surprisingly pretty average, especially against the run this year, but they did have the benefit of the offense just sitting on the ball. So this was a well-rested defense. I assume nothing will change against TCU, who, of course, beat Oklahoma State. They beat Texas. They lost in supremely ugly fashion to Iowa State. They mostly ran the ball pretty well with Darius Anderson and Kyle Hicks. Ken Hill most certainly took a step forward this year, even though he finished the season in kind of disappointing fashion. This was still a crazy good defense. A little leaky in the back, but that's Stanford's not the team to take advantage. I think the best thing in this game, especially considering we don't know what to expect out of Bryce Love and his usage, is the TCU defense. So I'm rolling with the Frogs because I am an Oregon fan. And what I have learned <laughs> is not to bet against TCU in San Antonio. It's still okay. hurts, Ty. What's, uh, what's our gift situation here? Uh, at the Alamo Bowl, we have, let me load it up real quick, Ty, because I was looking up things that made me sad, an Amazon Echo Show. I'm out. Ah, ha, ha. What is the show? It's It's got the little video monitor. Oh, uh, okay. It'll uh, show you things. The one. It's a $175 Amazon gift card. Okay. that's. I mean, that's significant. You can get a lot of things on Amazon. Um, we got a couple, Jody with an I and I had a couple of gifts at our wedding that were just like, yeah, here's like a thousand bucks to Amazon. And I'll tell you something, Ty. Yeah. Nothing made me happier. That'll work, right? Nothing made me happier. Living that prime Um, life, baby. Ah, fossil watch, a mini helmet, some Rockham socks. Rockham, really with a strong presence this year. They should send us some. We would wear them. Come on, Rockham. I'd wear them. I would 100% wear the beautiful Oregon Duck socks, those those Nittany Lion socks for Penn State. I think I'd be smirched the, the name of Rock'em Socks earlier, but I would... we take it back. Yeah, I'd take it back. I'd be willing to give them a try. Our feet are cold. Um, and a team panoramic photo. Okay. So, yeah, not bad. Not bad. All I right. I don't know where to eat in San Antonio. I apologize, but yeah, that's cool. The San Diego County Credit Union Holiday Bowl... I, this is my favorite game. Not the matchup. This is my favorite bowl game I've attended. Played, who would have guessed, in San Diego at San Diego County Credit Union Stadium. <laughs> it's all happening. Who knew that the credit union had all this damn money? Where does So where does the Rose Bowl play? What stadium? They oh, play at the, the, Rose, the bowl, Rose Bowl, Dan. Yeah. Okay. There just aren't as many syllables as the San Diego County <laughs> Credit Union Stadium. Do, do we no longer have the poinsettia bowl? Did that no. fall by the wayside? It's gone. So so the credit union just moved on up. Full disclosure, I was all sorts of mixed up when I was going through making my list. And I jotted down San Diego Cr- County Credit Union mm-hmm. poinsettia bowl just out of raw habit. Yeah. And then I had to go back and double take it and triple take it and... Yeah, no more poinsettia bowl. Enter the holiday bowl. San Diego County Credit Union. I guess upgrading here. Getting a game this year on December the 28th at 9 p.m. on FS1 between the Washington State squad led by Mike Leach Mm -hmm. and uh, Michigan State. 
led by one Mark D'Antonio. Wazoo is a three-point favorite. As you mentioned, this game is usually a lot of fun. I think there are many reasons why this one could be as well. Let's start with the gifts. What's our gift situation? Gift situation is as follows for the San Diego County Credit Union Holiday Bowl gift suite. Fossil watch. Ogio backpack. Okay. That's it? That's it. That's all I'm saying here. Okay. Probably a low interest rate mortgage or something if you're interested as well. I've got Wazoo to the tune of seven confidence points. I don't have much confidence in this. Originally, you might remember, I was all in on Wazoo. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was all in on them. Now I'm going to walk it back a little because the more I think about it, and you know I'm right, this is like 190% the kind of game that Michigan State wins in the ugliest possible fashion. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to go into the grain of that here. I'm going to stick with Wazoo because they were pretty good this season, especially on defense. I don't think this is the Wazoo that we've seen in the past where they go up against a good defense and automatically they're shut down. They can right. also play defense, and Michigan State has struggled offensively. So I'm going to go Wazoo. But I think, all told, a fun game, uh, a good one to watch, as the Holiday Bowl usually is. But let's go Wazoo. One of the, like, three or four games that's not on the ESPN family of networks. This is a Fox game. So maybe Gus Johnson will be calling this game. I don't know. I don't know what his basketball responsibilities are. And, by the way, I just remembered something when we were talking about the Poinsettia Bowl. I believe it was the Poinsettia Bowl between San Diego State and Navy. Was that the one with the flooding? I was going to say, like, the morning of, like, bowl officials were like, ooh, so the, the the field and stadium might be flooded. We have four <laughs> inches of water on the playing surface. This, yeah. we, are, we are up to our shins. <laughs> so uh, may, may the Poinsettia Bowl rest in peace. It's in the same stadium. I don't know if there will be Pacific Life commercials. I miss, you know, the, the whale. disco whale. Yeah. Hopefully there are. Um, I have Michigan State here. I think their defense, and as good as Washington State's defense also clearly is, with or without Alex Grinch moving forward, we'll see, but he'll at least be coaching in this game. I, I think Michigan State's defense, the fact that uh, Brian Lewerke was pretty accurate, pretty efficient, didn't throw down field a ton, although Penn State fans might disagree with <laughs> the yeah. downfield assessment because he hit some big ones in that game. Michigan State, of course, beat Michigan, Iowa, and Penn State. They didn't have a bad loss, even though they had ugly losses like to Notre Dame and the, the triple overtime one to Northwestern was pretty heartbreaking and just the murderous rampage that Ohio State went on. They didn't lose to a bad team. So that's at least a positive from where they were in 2016. They couldn't really run, which is a little bit surprising. But uh, yeah, the, the conservative passing game and really good defense mostly worked for Michigan State. Wazoo took a step back offensively, even with the, the win over USC and a shorthanded Oregon. It was, I think, a pretty disappointing year all in all for Luke Falk, who got benched a couple of times. Um, but yeah, that defense was flat out awesome this year. Hercules Mataafa was the best defensive player in the Pac-12. So I, I'm a little bit more confident in Michigan State, as you said, perhaps winning ugly 17, 16 type thing, maybe mid twenties confidence right now. We must move quickly through the let's final four bowls that we have on the slate here this evening, a little bit of a longer show. Thank you for hanging with us. Had a bunch of recruiting stuff to talk about some other bowl results that we needed to recap very quickly. It is ultimately free content. Yeah. And if you're listening to the show in an airport or on a plane right now, remember to hydrate when you're traveling, stay hydrated. It'll, it'll help your mood. I know things are getting rough. Stay hydrated. Get some caffeine. Happy to be here with you for the ride. Let's talk about the Belk Bowl. They play it at Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's mm -hmm. on December the 29th at 1 p.m. on ESPN. We've got Wake Forest and the Wolford Wagon. A three-point, pretty much home favorite yeah. over Texas A&M. Keep in mind that AM lost their coach. They did get Jimbo Fisher, but you know how I feel about teams when they lose their coach. So I'm naturally inclined to go with Wake Forest here to the tune of 25 <whistles> confidence points, Dan. You know, I've been a big fan of the Wolford Wagon all season. Sure. I don't know if AM cares at all about this game. So my inclination is to go Wake. I'm coming in heavy mm -hmm. with 25 confidence points. What's our gift situation? 
shopping trip to the Nordstrom department. Now, Belk <laughs> department stores. I don't even know if there is a Nordstrom in North Carolina. Maybe there is. Um, Fossil Watch getting in on the action. That's it. That is it. And once again, Ty, if I may, if you are going to the Belk Bowl and you're going to be in Charlotte, may I recommend Futo Buta Ramen. Yeah. We had some people that went to the ACC championship game that reported back and supposedly one of them played our show. Did, <laughs> did you see this? I did. Yeah. Played our show talking about this ramen spot, which we cannot stress enough. Does not pay us a single cent. Nope. To talk about how delicious this their is ramen organic. is. This is all organic. But we do expect a lot of free ramen if either one of us. If we ever go Charlotte, there, yeah. North Carolina. Goes without saying. We we love this place. Anyway, um, yeah, those are the two items. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I'm, I'm going Wake here. They had nice wins this year. They beat Louisville. They beat NC State. The Wolford wagon was rolling when he was healthy. Decent defense, despite the loss of Mike Elko. So I'm going Wake here. I know even with, you know, Texas A&M didn't really have a bad loss after that UCLA game to like a bad team on their schedule. Once Nick Starkle came back, it was sort of a different dynamic. But yeah, I'm going Wake here. Moving on, let's go to the Hyundai Sun Bowl. They play this one in the Sun Bowl, Dan. They do. In El Paso, Texas. December the 29th, 3 p.m. on CBS. We've got North Carolina State. The Wolfpack, a six and a half point favorite over new look, new model, cracking the coaching administrative matrix that is Arizona State. Mm-hmm. Um, Arizona State lost their coach. Yes. And they are, as we've mentioned time and time again, they're currently embroiled in this very weird, odd coaching transition. None of us has ever seen anything quite like this. But you said earlier that Todd Graham's going to coach the bowl game, right? He is. His final game with the Devils. So we've got two equal and opposite forces at play here. We've got perhaps players trying to send out Todd Graham on a high note. But we've got most of them probably playing in a game they couldn't care less about. North Carolina State, on the other hand, I think wants to close out the year strong. I think Mm -hmm. they're trying to build for the future. And there's too much uncertainty with the whole Arizona State thing that I think senior leadership on the part of Ryan Finley and others at North Carolina State will take over. I like them here to the tune of 30 confidence points, Dan. See, I was right there with you before I remembered a certain thing. And that is that I am very bad at picking games. (laughs) And my God, I think this is a good Costanza game. Costanza. You game. remember your your Costanza theory of, you know, everything that you feel, every everything that your gut tells you to follow the exact opposite. The opposite must be true. If the opposite must be true. The salmon swim up the stream, right? Absolutely. To me, it's NC State is solid. They're the type of team that beats teams that that have cracks. They have a, an efficient senior quarterback who doesn't screw up a whole lot. They've got good skill talent. They've got a great edge rusher. There's they just sort of have their act together. In Arizona State, they have this lame duck coach who has already been fired. There is something about Arizona State being such a bad pick that I can't mm. stop loving. Wow, I can't stop loving such this a pick. good they idea. They have a really good receiver in the Keel Harry, right? Yeah. Their their defense struggled a bit against the run, but it's not like NC State is this huge running team. I I, I like Demario Richard. He's a pretty good running back. The offense was fine this year. They beat they were like, I don't know. They were maybe three and a half plays from going nine and three. We were we were really excited about ASU for a moment in time this season. Sure. They, they beat Oregon, fully healthy Oregon. They beat yeah. Washington. They beat Utah, Arizona, the territorial. If you had told me before the season, Arizona State is beating Oregon, Washington, Utah, Arizona. That feels like such a successful year. And I get the Todd Graham thing. This is such a bad pick. I love it. It's tantalizing, Ty. Wow. It's, I mean, that's also the Costanza thing, right? Where yeah. he couldn't help but be in love with a woman who hated his guts. All right. I'm going to go NC State here, but I love the cut of your jib on this one, Dan. I really do. (laughs) I'm going Arizona State. The coordinators left. They got a lame duck coach. They're burning out of control out there in Tempe, but you're going to go with them anyway. I'm going with them anyway. It it makes so little sense. I have to. It's 100% the kind of thing that only happens in bowl season. Yes. What is our gift situation, by the way, before we move on to the next bowl game? 
Uh, there is a gift suite. There is Timely Watch Company. I love this sort of very cold war between Timely and Fossil. Yeah. Um, so you get a Timely Watch Company watch. Majestic Pro Base Fleece Pullover. Pro That's B-A-S-E. Base. Base. Um, Ogeo Politan Politan Backpack. Under Armour Cap and a coin. And just go eat Mexican food in El Paso. Lovely town. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl. Yeah. Competing only at the San Diego County Credit Union Holiday Bowl for most syllables in a bowl game. They play this one in Nissan Stadium in Nashville, Tennessee. Also on December 29th, this one at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. We got the Northwestern Wildcats. We got the Kentucky Wildcats. We got the Wildcat Bowl, Dan. Yeah. A whole lot of wildcatting yeah. going on here. Northwestern, a seven and a half point favorite. I am not a Northwestern believer. I've okay. been a big fan of the Quiet Storm motto for their nine and three season. Mm-hmm. And I realized they won their last seven games. They beat Iowa. They beat Michigan State. By all accounts, it was a pretty good year. Yeah. There's something about Northwestern that I can't buy into hook, line, and sinker. I'm definitely go in Kentucky plus the seven and a half. I think I'm going to go the Kentucky Wildcats outright to the tune of 12 confidence points. So I'm not feeling uber confident here, but uh, I'm going to ride Benny Snell one more time. Let's go right. Kentucky Wildcats, 12 confidence points. H- have fun with that defense. Have fun no. rooting for that no. defense, which was a disaster the second half yeah, of the not year. Good. Not great, Bob. Giving up about 40 points a game. Yeah, Kentucky beat Southern Miss. They beat Mizzou early on. They lose to Florida, which not a good year to lose to Florida. This is not anything that you can be okay with. Uh, they lose three or four to end the season. The offense is pretty decent. You mentioned Benny Snell. They were efficient enough with Steven Johnson through the air. Northwestern really didn't. I mean, the Duke loss wasn't great. They're bottom half of college football, but some pretty decent wins in Iowa, Michigan State, and Purdue. Uh, Justin Jackson, now a record-setting workhorse for Northwestern. Clayton Thorson, a little sloppier than I think people are expecting. Didn't do too much downfield. I think Northwestern is solid enough to win this game. I'm going Northwestern, and if you're going to Nashville, if you've not spent a lot of time in Nashville, I have not spent enough time, nearly enough time in Nashville as I should be spending. Uh, Prince's Hot Chicken. Go to the original. All right. If you're going to get hot chicken, you are going. You should be going to Prince's. And if you order the hot variety tie, you're going to struggle in the bathroom the next morning. That is just what I'm told will happen. What's our gift situation here? Our gift situation in the, what are we talking, Music City Bowl? Music City Bowl, Gift yeah. sweet, gift sweet, and we're back to Fossil. Ooh. Coming at you, Timely. All right. All right. And finally... Longer marathon show this evening, talking all mm-hmm. things recruiting and bowls and bowl recaps and fossil watches. The Cold yep. War between Fossil and Timely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Always. On December the 29th at 5.30, CBS Sports Network, the Nova Home Loans Arizona Bowl. They mm-hmm. play this one in Tucson at Arizona Stadium, Utah State, and New Mexico State. New Mexico State is a four-point dog here, but I'm going with them. Is this something like their first bowl game? Yeah. Did I read uh, that correctly? They got bowl eligible the last game of the year against, I want to say, South Alabama to get to six and six. They have not been to a bowl game in at least the modern era, I don't believe. So, hell yeah, New Mexico. Let's go New Mexico State here. 16 confidence points, Dan. Isn't this also an Aggie Bowl? Isn't Utah State also the Aggies? We've got a double Aggie situation. Yeah. Double Ag. Um, yeah, New Mexico State's okay. Utah, this is the most okay bowl matchup. Um, you know, Utah State's defense is pretty good. The offense isn't great. Everything's sort of okay. They didn't have a really good win. They'd lose to a, a pretty down Air Force this year. Uh, Tyler Rogers had a nice year for New Mexico State. Uh you know, decent enough offense for those Aggies. Jaleel Scott was a good receiver. Their pass defense was rough. New Mexico <laughs> State's. I'm, I'm going to go New Mexico State. I'm going to go with what feels right in my heart. What is our gift situation here to close it out? Our gift situation at the... Who, who, Nova, Nova Home, Home Loans. Loans, Dan. Yes. Nova Home Loans. They're giving away a gift suite, a watch. Unclear what brand. Ooh. Unclear. Uh, an OGO backpack and a beanie. 
I do not have a Tucson food recommendation, but I assume there's good Mexican food there. There you have it. Not too far from Nogales, Mexico. Whoo! Ten bowl games, seven recaps, Mm -hmm. a bunch of recruiting news. Can I ask you one question before we go? Sure. Just because it's been a long marathon show that has covered so many different aspects of college football between recaps, previews, recruiting, coaching news, whatever. Yeah. Can you very quickly explain to me the New York Times story about aliens? Oh, my God, Dan. Just because let's I want to I want to do this right. People might be listening in, in weird places. You know, maybe they're from a city and going out somewhere rural to see family or they're from somewhere rural and they're going to a city. Explain to me what everybody should know about. this. Did you not Times read the story? story? I only started reading it and I pocketed it and I wanted to I wanted to be surprised by your explanation. I am all in on the alien story from the New York. What is Times going on? Well, apparently, not to get too deep in the political weeds, but apparently there has been this covert investigative operation to study UFOs. To study this UFOs. Is, this is from the Pentagon. This is who it's through that department. It's from an official US government outfit. Mhm. Of some sort, they're studying UFOs. There was a video posted, a video submitted through the New York Times from back in 2004. I think it was a Navy pilot spotted what amounts to a UFO off the San Diego coast. I saw interviews with the gentleman, seemed like a straight shooter, wasn't drunk, wasn't on drugs, had a good night's sleep the night before, and clear as day, described what he saw as a 40-foot-long white tic-tac hovering above the surface, moving in ways that no one had ever seen anything move before. And he's convinced it was some sort of unidentified flying object. As they got close to it, it disappeared. What could it be? What, what is the prevailing theory of smart people? I don't know. I'm a smart person, and I'm going to contend <laughs> that it was some sort of UFO. We are not alone. I'm very excited. I saw the video and there was like a weird, like it was, it was just going in a line against the wind. Right. 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 It it was against the wind and it was started doing like rotating forward. You only get part of the story. If you read the New York times piece, what you really need to do is go on Reddit. You need to go on Reddit. You need to go on the UFO threads. You need to go on the physics threads. I've been there for the last couple days and I'm telling you, Dan, this is a thing, man. That was the Texas Tech Cal Holiday Bowl that year. That was the game that Cal ended up in because Mac Brown was campaigning against Cal. I, it was an Aaron Rodgers game. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And has Mac Brown ever said anything about no. a UFO off the coast of San Diego? Never. Interesting. Very interesting. Very This is a big deal for me this week. You know this. You know I'm into space. And I, I want to, was it a Mike Leach game? It was. Mike Leach could have been flying that thing for all we know. Oh, my God. It all is starting to add up, Ty. Thank you to everyone for bearing with us through, at a minimum, 80 minutes of college football content. Talked recruiting. Talked bowl recaps. Talked Lane Kiffin's 10-year contract. Talked about the Cold War between Timely and Fossil. And most importantly, we previewed 10 bowl games, Dan. Oh, Yeah. Oh, my God, Ty. Do you know who the MVP of that game was? Who? Sonny Cumbie. What? Sonny Cumbie, current TCU offensive coordinator, on the very same episode in which you have said that you are breaking up with TCU, also was the starting quarterback for Texas Tech in this The truth is out there, Dan. That's so weird. It's so weird. We will will talk more about this. Okay. In the postseason. Um... So we're going to do at least one other show, recapping bowl games, previewing the big ones that lie ahead. And then as we get into 2018, we'll not only recap the playoffs, but we're going to put together a big preview show talking about what you can all expect on January 8th for the national championship. Again, we're going to be in Atlanta. We're going to be doing a live show. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for more information on when you can buy that second run of tickets if you're interested in coming to the show. And also, you might want to pay attention to your social feeds for some other stuff that we might have cooking up in the lab right now. For sure. I'm excited. I'm pumped. For that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein, in beautiful Southern California, for myself, Ty Hildebrandt, 
over here in blustery, in wintry, in soon to be perhaps white Christmassy Eastern Pennsylvania. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a happy holidays wherever you might be. We'll catch you all on the flip side. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace.